Hello there, I'm Jamie. Welcome to another session of Vistex Pro Services. In this session, I'll quickly take you through the process of creating and publishing animated rendered frames of products using 3ds Max, V-Ray and WebRotate 360. While Unreal Engine is an amazing tool to showcase your work and products to clients in a physical location, 90% of your customers will have a glance of your products through a web browser first before they even consider visiting your physical location. For this reason alone, it's utterly crucial to dazzle them first on your website. WebRotate 360 is one of the best tools out there to help you achieve this using pre-rendered frames of photos. These are a few examples of products previously published with WebRotate 360. I personally found it indispensable to showcase my clients products in key industries such as design, fashion, retail, automotive, product design, gym equipment, etc. In summary, you will learn how to set up the 3S Max scene Load up the Vero rendering engine and set up a 3D scene for draft renders. Create and set up a Vero dome light. Add the Vero environment exposure control. Apply and edit the Vero SGRI light. Create and edit a camera animation. Create and edit a Vero material. Add and edit HDRI to the environment. Add and edit a 3ds Max lap file in a frame buffer. Create and edit a stainless steel material. Set up V-Ray for high resolution renders, create an animatic preview, fixing gamma issues, use the LUT Explorer script to save the render with the LUT applied, use Garage Farm to render the frames, create Photoshop actions to automatically apply LUT files and reduce image sizes, and upload and launch your files using WebRotate 360 Spot Editor. So without further ado, let's start with a 3ds Max file named WebRotate360-Star.Max. To set up the display unit scale, click on a customized toolbar and choose a units option from the list. The display unit scale is currently in millimeters. Some users prefer meters or centimeters. For the purpose of this exercise, let's keep the display in millimeters. These metric systems won't affect the scale of the object in the scene. If you wanted to affect the scale of objects in a scene, you would need to go to the System Unit Setup toggle and change it from there. For example, you could scale the scene by setting one unit to be equivalent to two, which would have scaled the entire scene twice over. Go back to the main parameters and click OK to close the dialog. The following step is to load up the V-Ray rendering engine. To do so, simply click on the Render Setup button to open its dialog. Before we load up V-Ray rendering engine, Let's set up the render output size as square by typing in 640 pixels by 640 pixels and lock the image aspect ratio by clicking on this padlock. To load up the rendering engine, scroll down and expand it assign render parameters. Click on a production toggle and choose a Vero rendering engine from the choose render dialog. With Vray now loaded, open the Vray tab and expand the Vray frame buffer rollout parameters and the global switches. By default, most Vray parameters are hidden. To expand them to export mode, simply click on the default button twice. Scroll down the image sampler rollout parameters. The progressive image sampler type is quite fast for local test renders. However, it doesn't support strip renders, animations and other important crucial render features. For this reason, we are going to choose a bucket type instead and display its parameters in export mode. Next, increase the minimum shading rate to 64. Increasing this function's value improves the image quality without affecting the rendering time. Expand the image filter. The image is set to V-Ray Lanxus filter by default. I personally prefer the area type because it doesn't generate artifacts in bright areas. However, feel free to experiment with any other image filters listed here. Under bucket image sampler parameters, change the max subdivision to 100 for universal workflow. Expand the global DMC rollout parameters and click on the default button to display the advanced parameters. To quickly explain how these values affect the render quality, the global DMC noise threshold values should always be lower than the noise threshold value of the bucket image sampler. As you can see, this noise threshold is currently set to 0.01 .01 and the global DMC noise threshold is set to 0.005. These two separate values are good enough for draft renders. However, they will be later decreased for final renders. Expand the color mapping rollout parameters. Reinhard is a default color mapping type. However, for the purpose of this exercise, we are going to use exponential type. 
I often use exponential color mapping because it provides a more photorealistic look to my renders and tones down the overexposed bright areas. Having said that, feel free to experiment with any other types of color mapping to see what works best. Click twice here to display the parameters in export mode. In a dark and bright multiplier, I often leave the values as 1.0 unless I'm working with real footage for a movie or photo montage. Keep the default gamma value as 2.2. Keep the effect background function. In a mode type, always use a color mapping in gamma. This color mapping type corrects the discrepancy between what you see in a frame buffer and what is saved in your hard drive. Expand the environment rule out parameters. This is a section where we will be using HDRI images for reflection. Next, open the GI tab. The default primary engine is set to brute force, which is good. However, users often need to increase the samples very high to get rid of the grain. To speed things up, we are going to use the radiance map instead. To display the expert parameters, click on this button twice. Choose the radiance map as a primary engine and keep the light cache as a secondary engine. Enable the ambient occlusion function. Ambient occlusion asks connecting shadow details in directly lit areas, which makes your renders more realistic and appealing. Increase the radius to 300mm and the subdivisions to 16. The subdivision values smooth out grainy connecting shadows. Expand the origin map rule out parameters and change the current preset to low as a starting point. For more complex scenes, users often choose the medium and sometimes high in extremely complex scenes. Change the display to expert type by clicking the button twice. Enable the show direct light function in case we end up using direct lights in the scene. This function is quite useful to preview the direction of direct shadows during the pre-calculation process before the rendering starts. This is useful to determine whether to cancel the pre-calculation or not, if the shadow directions are not correct. Expand the light catch roll out parameters and keep the current settings as they are. Open the settings tab and enable the advanced settings by clicking this function. Always leave the dynamic memory limit to zero, so V-Ray can use as much memory as possible. And click render to see the first draft. As you can see, the render is completely black at the moment because there are no lights in the scene. Next, close the render dialog and expand the viewport. In a create panel, click on the lights button and choose the V-Ray type from the list. In the object type, click on the V-Ray light button and drag and drop it in the top viewport to create it. While the light is still selected, click on the modify panel and rename the light as V-Ray light underscore dome. Since this 3S Max scene setup is similar to a real studio lighting with diffuse shadows, we are going to convert this light into a dome type and plug an HDRI of a real studio light in its image toggle. In a light general parameters rollout, change its type to dome and expand its parameters. Since we will be using an HDRI map, let's reduce the current multiplier value from 30 to 10 as a starting point. Next, let's enable the invisible function to make the dome object invisible in the render, but still affecting the scene. And then check the effect reflections function. Sometimes the reflection of a dome map doesn't look nice on objects. For this reason, we will be using the environment HDRI instead. Select a perspective viewport and do another test render. To add the camera exposure, simply press 8 on your keyboard or go to the rendering toolbar and choose the environment from the drop down list. In environment dialog, under exposure control, choose the viewer exposure control from the list. Minimize the dialog. The following step is to plug the HDRI studio image in a light toggle. Click on the texture toggle and expand the V-Ray rollout shaders. Double click on the V-Ray HDRI shader to load it and choose this HDRI studio light. HDRI stands for High Dynamic Range Image. In a nutshell, these types of light based images are created by capturing multiple photos with different exposures at the same time, which are amazing to emulate realistic lights and reflections. The one website I often go to find amazing HDRI maps is DoshDesign.com. To find them, simply Google Dosh Design. Here, you can find a host of HDRI maps for studio lighting and reflections, for cities and much more. With a click of a button, users can quickly go through their vast and diverse library of assets. It's definitely a must go to for most professionals.
To edit this URI map, simply click on the Material Editor button to open this dialog first. Next, drag and drop the Dome Texture toggle into one of the Material Editor slots. Choose the Instance method and click OK. Now you have the SURI map parameters loaded with the SURI map. The mapping type is currently set to spherical, which is perfect. However, sometimes it's displayed as 3ds Max standard, which is not correct. As mentioned earlier, spherical mapping is perfect. Leave the remaining parameters as they currently are and do another test render. Much has improved, however, the current render will look a lot more interesting and realistic with a nice HDRI reflection applied to the environment toggle. Before we do this, first we are going to create an animated camera to create the frames to later upload in a web rotate 360 application. In the create panel, click on the camera button and select the target type. Click and drag it in the top viewport to create the camera. While the camera is still selected, open the modify panel and change it to a free camera type. We've just changed the camera to free type to have the flexibility to move the camera at will. We can change it back to targeted afterwards. In the front viewport, right click and choose to move the camera upwards to center the product. Next, select the perspective viewport and press C on your keyboard to change the view to camera. Move it away from the product slightly in the top viewport to frame the product properly. To ensure that the exact framing we see in the viewport is coherent with the rendered frame buffer, Click on the camera tags and choose to show save frame option from the list. Move the camera position a bit further until the product is centered properly. To remove the grid currently displayed in the viewport, simply click on this plus text and select the show grid option from the list. Frame the camera a bit better. For the purpose of this exercise, we are going to create a 180 degrees camera animation following a circle. To start, let's go to the Create panel and click on the Shapes button, followed by clicking on the Circle button. To ensure this circle is created from the center of the product, click the cursor in the middle of the product and drag it upwards until it reaches the camera. Release the mouse click to exit the creation. Next, while the circle is still selected, open the Modify panel. To ensure the camera follows the circle path smoothly, we are going to increase interpolation steps first. Expand interpolation rollout parameters. If you zoom in closer to the circle, you will notice that the circle is not totally smooth by default. Increase interpolation steps to smooth out the circle. Now we have a very smooth path for the camera to follow. Because we want the camera to follow 180 degrees of the full circle, we are going to add the editable spline modifier by clicking on this editable spline button here. Otherwise, simply click on this arrow here and select the editable spline from modifier list. While searching on the list, you can always press E on your keyboard to quickly get to letter E on the list. All these buttons have been customized by simply clicking on this button and choosing to configure modifier sets. In this dialog, you can replace or add new buttons by clicking here followed by dragging and dropping your modifier from this section to the button here and click OK. That's how I was able to customize all these buttons here. We are using the Edible Spline modifier because it's safer to keep changes in this modifier stack in case you need to go back and rectify any of the previous changes. Delete the extra Edible Spline modifier. To start editing, enable the segment button. In the top viewport, select half of the circle by clicking and dragging the cursor from left to right followed by pressing delete on your keyboard. If you turn off this light bulb here, it hides the editable spline changes, in case you want to reverse them. Go back to create panel. In a front viewport, move the circle up to where the camera is. Some clients may want their products to be displayed in 360 degrees. If that were the case, you'd simply turn off the editable spline here and animate the full circle. For this specific project, the client didn't want the back of the product to be seen. Therefore, we are only animating 180 degrees of the full circle. Also, we want the camera to start from this side of the product to this side to complete the 180 degree circle. Before we start the animation, we need to set the number of frames we want the animation to have. 40 frames is more than sufficient for an 80 degrees animation. 
and 80 frames for a full 360 degrees animation horizontally. The same would have applied for an animation rotated vertically. To set up the number of frames, simply click on the Time Configuration button, leave the current settings as they currently are, and change the end frame to 40 instead, and click OK. As you can see, the number of frames have been reset to 40. Next, select the camera and change its type back to Target Camera. We are using a targeted camera because during our animation, we want the camera to be looking at a product at all times. Select and move the camera target to the center of the product. As mentioned earlier, we want the camera to rotate from this side to this side while looking at the product at all times. Select the circle again and enable the editable spline modifier again. Select the camera and open the motion panel. Under parameters, expand the assign controller ruler and select the position. Next, click on the assign controller button and choose the path constraint from the list and OK to close the dialog. Click on the add path button and select the circle. As you can see, an animation was immediately created for the 40 frames previously set. To check the animation, simply drag this slider from left to right. While the camera is rotating, its target is always constrained to the view, hence we had to center the camera target. As mentioned earlier, it took 40 frames for the camera to complete 180 degrees movement along the path while constantly looking at the product. In a path parameters, we have the constant velocity enabled and check the loop function to prevent the camera from jumping back to frame zero. Move the animation slider a bit more to check the animation. Save the scene incrementally in case the file crashes abruptly. Open the render setup dialog by clicking on this button. Next, select the camera viewport and lock it by clicking on this padlock here. This is to prevent Max from rendering unwanted viewboards. Save the scene again and do another test render. The following step is to create some of the main materials of our product before we apply this URI map to the environment toggle. Open the material editor. Select a new material slot and click on the Get Material button. In the Scene Materials ruler, right click to check the parameters. We are seeing only one material because the Filter Selected Objects function is enabled. Otherwise, all materials in the scene would be visible by unchecking the function. Right click again on it. Users can also choose how the material thumbnails are displayed here and much more. Enable the Filter Selected Objects function again to display the selected objects in the scene only. Double click on the material to load it in the material slot. It's a standard material by default. Click on the standard toggle and choose a V-Ray material from the list. In its diffuse color swatch, select and make it completely blank to match the client's color specification. And check the highlight glossiness function to fully control its parameters. Also, uncheck the Fresnel function. Click on the reflect color swatch and increase the surface reflectivity by making its default color brighter. Brighter colors make a surface more reflective and darker colors have the opposite effect. Double click on the material slot to have the better preview of the material. Click on the background button to preview the reflections. The more apparent the checkers are in a sphere, the more reflections there are on a selected material. This is fully reflective. If you slide a color to completely black, there will be no reflections as you can see. For this exercise, we need a surface to have some reflectivity. To add a bit of sheen to the surface, decrease the highlight glossiness value slightly. As you can see, the higher the values, the smaller the sheen and vice versa. The reflection glossiness determines the sharpness of the reflections. Lower values diffuse the reflections and high values do the opposite. If we increase the reflectivity here, the reflection glossiness will be more apparent in the material preview. Notice how the reflections behave when we increase and decrease the reflection glossiness values here. Now that we are happy with the reflection glossiness values, we can now reduce the reflectivity by making its color swatch darker. The less reflection, the more of the diffuse color will be seen. Let's do another quick render. As you can see, the surface of the product is currently not looking very interesting because there's nothing interesting in the environment. To 
correct this, open the V-Ray tab and scroll down to the Environment Rollout Parameters. Enable the Refraction function. Select the material slot with HDRI map and drag and drop it into the reflection toggle. Choose the copy method. Because we will be making changes to the parameters, drag and drop them into a new material slot. Choose the instance method because we want these changes to affect the reflection toggle. Rename this new material A as reflection and do another test render. As you can see, the surface is looking more interesting now. Under Processing, increase your overall and render multiplier values to 2.0 and do another test render. The overall render is looking increasingly better now. The following step is to load up the 3D LUT files to make the render a bit more interesting. LUT files stand for Lookup Table and are often used to change the colors and or the contrast of an image. To load one, click on the Show Corrections Control button first, enable the LUT function and click on a load toggle. Pick this LUT file from 3D Collective website here. They have a huge list of amazing LUT files to choose from. Check their website in a descriptions link. When you first load the LUT file, it might look overly bright. To correct this, simply uncheck the function to convert the lock space before applying LUT. The overall render is now looking a lot more appealing. Turn the LUT function on and off to see the huge difference it's making to the overall render. Increase your overall and the render multiplier to 3.0 and do another test render. Decrease the values back to 2.0 and do another test render. Because this is an animation, let's test render some of the frames to see what they're looking like. Slide the animation bar to a few frames to test render the angles. The next material we'll be working on is the stainless steel knob in the middle. Enable the Move tool and select the object in the scene. And click on the Get Material button to load its current material. Once loaded, change it to V-Ray Material as previously done. Use some of the previous steps to set up this new material. Enable the track mouse while rendering. This function allows users to pick areas of the V-Ray frame buffer to render first with the mouse. In the BRDF rollout parameters, let's change it to a ward type. This type is more coherent with the metallic finish. Double click the material slot to preview it more closely. Enable the background button to see the reflection. Increase the reflectivity a bit more. To emulate a nice and realistic stainless steel reflections, we are going to apply a pre-prepared grayscale texture in the anisotropy function. To do so, click on the anisotropy toggle. In the material map browser dialog, expand the standard rule out and choose the bitmap shader, followed by choosing this real black and white texture. Notice how its highlight pattern changed immediately in the material slot. Click on the go to parent button to go to the main basic parameters. Next. Copy this material by right clicking on a toggle and choosing to copy. Extend the maps rollout. In a bump toggle, set its value to about 10, followed by right clicking and choosing to paste the previously copied texture. Again, the material surface has changed sub subsequently. Let's do another test render to check the changes. Slide the frame to 20 and do another test render. Increase the reflectivity slightly and do another test render. The radial stainless steel material is now coming through OK. The following step is to improve the render settings to increase the quality of the render. To start, go to the V-Ray tab and decrease the bucket image sampler noise threshold to about 0.004 and the global DMC noise threshold value to about 0.004. 
and do another test render. Next, let's increase the render output size to really improve the quality. In a common step, increase the width and height output size to 3000 pixels. This final change should remove some of the grain seen here. As you can see, most of the grain is now removed. Some companies tend to render as high as 5000 pixels or higher to achieve even higher resolution. Let's do another test render to see other material details. To check how smooth the current animation is, let's create a quick animatic preview. Press T on your keyboard to convert this viewport to a top one and turn its display to wireframe. Select the camera viewport and maximize it. Next, click on the tools toolbar, followed by going to the preview create viewport and choosing to create preview animation. The activate time segment is set to from zero to 40. In the visual style, change the rendering level to shaded and click to create. The animatic preview is now created. Open the render setup dialog and go to the view rate tab. Click on the show last frame buffer to display the last render. If you were to save this frame as it is, this is what you would look like by clicking the duplicate to max frame buffer button. As you can see, all view rate settings are OK, including the display colors in sRGB here. A render being this dark is an indication that the gamma is currently disabled in 3ds Max. To correct this, simply go to Customize Toolbar and choose the Preferences option. In its dialog, go to the Gamma and LUT tab and check the Enable Gamma LUT correction, which is currently set to 2.2. Let's duplicate to Max Frame Buffer again to see. This is what the current rendered frame would look like after being saved into the hard drive. This is because Vray doesn't automatically save the LUT file currently applied to the Vray frame buffer. To correct this, let's render the full frame first. Because the client will probably ask you to change the background color, it's important to render these frames as a PNG type to make the background automatically transparent. To save the rendered frame with the current LUT file applied, we're going to run a Chaos Group script called LUT Explorer. To run the script, simply click on the scripting toolbar and choose to run script, followed by selecting and opening the script. In this dialog, you have this first toggle to locate and load your LUT files. If you intend to save just the current LUT file loaded in your frame buffer, ensure to have only one LUT file in a chosen location. Otherwise, the script will automatically save every single LUT variation in your chosen folder. Click on the toggle and find your folder location. Under the Find LUTs, you should automatically see the 3D LUTs in a chosen location. The Auto Apply selection is enabled by default. Otherwise, you'd have had to click on the button. Under Variations Exporter, you can click on the Pick the Output Folder Your Variations toggle to choose your folder location. Name and save it as a PNG file type and click the Save Variations button. Once the variation is saved into a folder, the current LUT applied to the V-Ray frame buffer is automatically turned off. To view the saved variation, simply click on a rendering toolbar and choose to view image file and open your save file. As you can see, this is the saved render image with a LUT file applied. Select the V-Ray frame buffer and enable the LUT function again to compare the two. Because you'll be rendering 40 frames, it's not practical to use this script in this manner. We are going to render the frames and use a Photoshop action to automatically apply a LUT file to all frames. We use LUT files specific to Adobe Premiere After Effects files instead. To render the frames, let's open the Render Setup dialog. In a common step, enable the active frame. Scroll down and enable the Save file, followed by clicking the Files toggle. Name your file and set it up as a PNG file type. Enable the RGB 48-bit with Alpha Channel option. Check the rendering settings. If you have any products to render, you're probably better off using a render farm instead to save time and money. I often use a render farm called Garage Farm. Before using that services, you need to register, download and install that software first and open the Render Beamer dialog in your computer. Next, in 3ds Max, click on the Render Beamer toolbar 
and choose to beam it up. Click OK to the first time render tip dialog to open the render beamer dialog. For this project, we are going to choose the camera animation render mode from the list. Each mode has a quick description of what it does. Under Cameras Rollout, choose the selected camera animation. Also, under Camera Animation Rollout Parameters, choose to save light cache and click to send to form. You should see the progress of your 3ds Max file being uploaded into the garage form. Once the file is successfully uploaded, click to copy the link to clipboard and paste it onto your browser. Log into Garage Form to submit the animation. As you can see in red, I'm currently using high priority machines. Click to submit the job. Once submitted, you can follow the rendering progress here. Back to rendering Beamer dialog. Click to close the open dialog. Once the job is completed, you should receive an email notification. In a garage form, you can see all the job details here, including the cost. All 41 frames came down to $8 only, even while using high priority machines. To see the rendered frames, click on the Downloads tab and refresh. Next, enable and right click here. You can choose to download here, list files or open directory. There, you can see all the rendered frames. If you wanted to rotate the same camera vertically, you would do the following. Select the spline, hold on the Ctrl key and press V on your keyboard. Choose to copy the spline. Next, right click and choose to rotate the spline. To ensure the spline is rotated and snapped into a specific angle, enable the angle snap toggle and right click on it. Here, you can see it's set to automatically snap every 5 degrees. Begin rotating the spline in X axis until it reaches 90 degrees. In a left viewport, rotate it again to 90 degrees in Z axis. Next, select this camera and copy it by holding down the control key and pressing V on your keyboard. Rename the camera as underscore vertical. As previously done, open the motion panel and extend the assigned controller rollout. Select the position controller and click on the assigned controller button. Choose the path constraint and OK. Followed by clicking on the add path button and selecting the new spline. Move the slider to see what's happening with the camera. The camera needs a target to look at. Let's change the camera type to targeted as previously done. Click on the Select From Scene button and select the camera target. Move the camera target to the center of the product. Move the animation slider to see the changes. As the camera reaches the top of the product, it turns abruptly because of the direction it's looking at. Select the camera viewport and change it to a new camera. Move the animation slider a few more times to check what's happening. Next, select and rotate the camera 190 degrees so the camera starts on the opposite side. Move the animation slider again. To prevent the camera from turning abruptly, we are going to create a new camera and animate it manually. First, let's change the color of this camera to avoid selecting the wrong one. Select the main camera and copy it as previously done. Rename it as Camera Vertical Animated. Move the animation slider again. To begin animating, click on the Auto key button. Move the animation slider to frame 10. 3ds Max will work out the frames in between. Change the camera view to the new camera and choose to select the camera. Deselect the snap toolbar. Move the camera up and rotate it so it's always focused on the product. Also, always ensure the product is always at the center of the camera frame. Move the slider another 10 frames and repeat the previous step until we reach frame 40. Move the animation slider a few times to see what's happening on each frame. 
Once you're happy with everything, simply send it to render as previously done. It's worth noting that there are two types of 3D rotation modes in Web Rotate 360. The first type is a simple one and only requires two rows, one horizontal and another one vertical, which helps a lot to reduce the number of rendered frames and costs. The second rotation type is a full multi-row mode, which we'll cover in another video. If you happen to be a photographer for a company, you could use a similar approach to set up your own camera rig before uploading the photos into Web Rotate 360. Back in Photoshop CC 2018, open one of the 40 frames previously rendered by clicking on a file toolbar and choosing to open, followed by opening the frame in Photoshop. To create an action to automatically apply a Photoshop LUT file and save it in a different location, simply go to Windows toolbar and select the Actions tool from the list or simply hold down the O key and F9 on your keyboard. In the Actions tab, create a new action by simply clicking on this button and selecting a new action. In the New Action dialog, rename it as LUT Jamie and click Record. The red button is an indication that it's, it's started recording. To apply the Photoshop LUT, simply click on Adjustment Layer button and choose the Color Lookup option from the list. In this Properties tab, click on the Load 3D LUT. The LUT file we are going to pick is specific to Photoshop and couldn't be used in a 3ds Max scene. Locate and load it. This is a Photoshop LUT file similar to the one used in 3D Max. Next, click on the File Toolbar and choose to save PNG in a different folder. Accept the default values to save it. Next, Click to close the original document and choose not to save file as an Adobe Photoshop document. Once closed, click to stop recording the action. You can test this new action in a test file to see if it works as expected. Once happy, select all 40 frames apart from the one just saved. and apply this new action by simply clicking on the play button. As you can see, the new action applies the LUT file, saves the file in a new folder and closes the document automatically. Here you can see all 40 frames with the LUT automatically applied to. As mentioned earlier, users can also apply LUT files specific to Adobe Premiere or After Effects, followed by rendering out the frames in a separate folder. If your renders are too large to be uploaded in Web Rotate 360, simply save them again at a smaller size, or use a Photoshop action to reduce image sizes without affecting the quality. To do so, open a test image, create a new action as previously done, Go to File and choose Export, followed by choosing to Save for Web. Here, you can see the new image size reduced while previewing the display quality. Try any of the presets here to test the size and the overall quality. Once happy with the file size and the quality, click to save it into a separate folder. Click now to save the file as an Adobe Photoshop document. Stop the recording action. This new action can be used in all 40 frames. To upload and publish pre-rendered images or photos, you need to download and install Web Rotate 36 and Spot Editor. To launch it, simply double click on the Spot Editor button. In a new project dialog, type in the project name. Here, you can select the folder location where you want your new project to be saved. This is the location where your pre-rendered files or photos will be pulled from to be launched. In the import section, you have the number of rows. For this exercise, we're only using one row. If we had rendered another vertical row, we would have had to type in two rows instead. And click to create. This is an example of another project. These blue lines represent the viewing dimensions on your web page. You can tweak these by sliding the width and height values here. You can also set the zoom in dimensions on images by going to the image tab and tweaking with these parameters. 
it's best not to set it too high because user screen size differ more often than not. In a rows tab, we have all the pre-uploaded images. Users can also add new rows if desired. We also have the canvas parameters here. Users can add text watermarks, set the text size, image watermarks, and etc. We also have the filter section here, the control tab. If we hover over, it actually displays what each setting does. Here, users can choose a specific image or a row to start with as they land on a web page. Users can also add hotspots. There are quite a few here, but let's try this one. We can customize indicators by loading them from here. Image content is a section where users can add images to the hotspots. Here we have the text content with styles and fonts. The action tab allows users to choose from a list of actions to be executed on hotspot click. The label section allows users to select from a list of frames or pre-animated images. To create a hotspot, simply click on a specific part of an image, rotate, and place another hotspot to define its path. It goes without saying that the paths will not be visible on a web page once published. You just can also choose the skin interface here. There are all these options available. Once you're happy, simply click to publish. Pick and choose the project output directory. Here, you can choose the FTP connection to your website. Choose the browser to test. We also have a number of templates to choose from. These options are very important. Accept the remaining options and click to publish. This is the final project published on a browser. Finally, here we have a list of free plugins to help you integrate your projects with e-commerce websites using these platforms. These are quick and easy to integrate and do not require any coding. For more information about this tutorial, please contact me and check the description links. This concludes our tutorial. I really hope you found it useful. Like and share it. And I hope to see you on my next one.